evening, everybody, and greetings, citizens and scientists of the big, weird, wild, and wonderful world in which we live. I, as always, am your humble science communicator, the Great Orbax, and I'm located here in Physics Hollywood in the McNaughton Building at the University of Guelph, and I'd like to thank everybody joining us tonight for our summer series of our Guelph Physics live stream event. Um, it's an exciting one tonight. We've got a pretty in-depth speaker that we uh, are getting a unique opportunity to chat with. Um, I'd like to remind people that uh, thank you so much for joining us on Facebook and on YouTube if you're out there. Um, this is a live Q&A, so while we'll be having our chat, feel free to ask questions and we'll bring them up in the comment section as they're coming through. Um, and if you have questions about the topic or about physics in general, we're always happy to answer your questions here at the Guelph Physics live stream. Now, in a uh, rare occurrence, I've prepared some words to say before we begin this evening. And so, why don't we take a look here? Uh, while I bring those up, I'd also like to point out that if you've uh, enjoyed, uh, if you enjoy this evening, or if you're curious about what we do here at Guelph Physics, uh, head on over to the Guelph Physics YouTube page. That's Guelph Physics on YouTube. You can also find us on Facebook at Guelph Physics. And while you're there, we have an entire series of these live stream events that are living in our archives. So please go ahead and enjoy. Take a look at what you're interested in. And as always, feel free to reach out to us afterwards. <clears throat> Since Dmitry Mendeleev created the periodic table over 150 years ago, scientists have understood that the elements that make up the universe can be organized by their atomic weights. That's approximately the total number of protons and neutrons that occur in the nucleus. Well, what's taken us longer to understand, though, is where these elements actually come from. Uh, it turns out that the light elements that we have in our universe were created in the Big Bang, and those get fused inside the bellies of stars to create heavier elements. Now, this works for a lot of the lighter elements up to about iron, which is element 26. But with 118 elements in the periodic table, where do the rest of these actually come from? And I'm talking about elements that are still even fairly common that we don't understand their origin, like elements like gold. Uh, for years, scientists have thought that our supply of gold has come from a process known as Rumpelstiltskinning, where a supernatural imp uses a spinning wheel to turn large crops of untreated straw into nuggets of the valuable ore. But this process only describes the origin of gold and not of the many other heavy elements of the periodic table. Tonight's guest will shed some light on how incredible cosmic events may actually be at the heart of this process. Dr. Daniel Siegel is a theoretical astrophysicist interested in connecting fundamental physics with the cosmos. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Physics here at the University of Guelph, and he also serves in a position as an associate faculty member at the Perimeter Institute. Prior to joining us here at Guelph, he spent three years as a NASA Einstein postdoctoral fellow at Columbia, and prior to that, he received his PhD from the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in Potsdam, Germany. Please give a warm Guelph Physics live stream welcome to our guest this evening, Dr. Daniel Siegel. Let's bring him in. How are Hello, you? Max. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, very exciting to be on, on the stream. No and that problem. was a beautiful introduction. Um, oh. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Now, uh, well, we've got all types of things that we can discuss tonight uh, from these cosmic events to pulling uh, physics, fundamental physics towards it, to the discussion of the formation of elements, to talking about neutron stars, to talking about collisions, gravitational waves. I mean, there literally could be anything that we discuss tonight, but we like to start the stream often by trying to find out from our guest what the most exciting thing that they think about their work is. Yeah, so I'm a theoretical astrophysicist. And um, to me, I guess the most exciting thing about my work is um, the potential every day, essentially, to learn uh, about the how the universe actually works. Um, that may sound a little simple and perhaps naive, but um, I think there's a little uh, there's something more profound to this. Um, if, if you think about it, astrophysics is, is is very different from many other fields in physics and, and in fact, science, um, in that we cannot just take the universe or any phenomenon, any astrophysical system out there uh, and put it under a microscope uh, or put it in a lab and actually study it in, in, in detail and, and experiment with it. But we only see very indirect um, 
um, observations, um, often um, through sub-messengers, uh, say light or gravitational waves or particles. And um, and from these very indirect observations that we have, we have to actually figure out what what's actually going on out there in in the universe. And and to me, it's it's very astonishing um, um, and and very fascinating um, that uh, even despite this very indirect evidence, we we can often um, sort of really uh, figure out what's going on out there um, and actually learn about how the universe actually works. Well, that that's kind of one of the most exciting things I think about looking beyond the earth, right? You know, when we're doing an experiment here, it, it's as if we're the external observers looking in and we have all the tools and we have all the pieces and we can see everything that's happening. But when we look up, it's almost the reverse of it as if we're inside the experiment and we're trying to piece together what the experimenter is doing. Uh, right. based on what we see. You brought up some interesting topics just in, in that, that brief description, and I guess we might as well kind of just jump right into a few of them. And one of the things that I sort of notice a lot with, with, with the introductions to your work and what I think is fundamentally a really exciting new thing is this idea of looking at signals from the universe, which previously we kind of looked at as being visual signals things in the visible light range, uh, optical signals, if you want to call them that. And now we keep hearing, and again, this, this seems, having been somebody who's grown up through the phase where this didn't exist prior to it, we're now looking at gravitational wave signals and seeing how those affect and change and tell us. Um, can you expand on that and talk a little bit about that for us? Sure. So we live in a very exciting time, I would say. So as you mentioned, um, so now we detect gravitational waves. Um, and in particular, my research is in a in a very new field, I would say, um, something that we call multi-messenger astronomy, something that's uh, in, in, in this form only exists, uh, existed for a couple of years now. Um, and so what we're trying to do is essentially combine uh, different information that we receive from the universe about particular events. Uh, and so try to figure out um, with sort of that complementary information, um, what actually what actually happened in 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 certain um, cosmic events, and um, so this has been really um, enabled uh, has been enabled by um, gravitational wave detectors, um, who for the first time, as Obax uh, mentioned, um, detected gravitational waves um, a few years ago, in, in uh, actually in 2015, and that was uh, published in 2016. So. Uh, say around five years or so now, we've uh, been able to detect um, gravitational waves, uh, so little uh, ripples in in, in space-time, as as we uh, as we call them. Um, so little perturbations in the structure of of space and time, uh, essentially um, generated by moving masses, um, uh, similar to like a little um, electrons, little charges, uh, like in an antenna. That uh, as they sort of oscillate or as they um, as they accelerate, uh, create um, uh, electromagnetic waves. Um, and so, moving masses, um, and it turns out very compact masses uh, is what you need, um, like black holes or neutron stars, uh, generate gravitational waves. Um, and so, um, these uh, gravitational waves can now be detected uh, together with uh, observable light um, from such systems as well. And that gives us uh, a much uh, sort of more complete picture um, about um, black holes and, and neutron stars and uh, and how they collide, for example. Yeah, I mean, so there's there's, there's a, a couple of things that spring to mind from there. As you mentioned, it's such a brand new thing. You know, we're, we're looking on the order of five, six years since the inception of being able to even yeah. detect these, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, Based on that, we we have this maybe a hundred years of reliable astronomy that we can kind of uh, also look at hand in hand. I guess one of the questions that I have about something like this is when you have this new technique, do you see a flood of new data and new phenomenon? Or do you just sort of use it to reestablish things that you already think you know or look at uh, uh, processes or, or cosmic events that you already are aware of and then compare the new data with that to get a fuller picture. Yeah, gr great point. So um, I would argue that um, it, it really allows us uh, to find new phenomena out there that uh, we're not, um, that, that we didn't know of before. 
So, for example, if I just take the example of black holes, right? So, yeah, strictly really speaking, mind. yeah, strictly speaking, we didn't have any definite <laughs> sort of proof or um, definite evidence for the existence of of black holes before LIGO turned on their detectors, um, and so to some to some degree, um, this first detection of a, of the collision of two black holes that that these detectors saw was also a uh, direct confirmation for the existence of, um, of of stellar mass black holes out there in the universe. Um, so a phenomenon really that um, um, that couldn't be explored in 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 that sense before. Um, and so yeah, we're clearly finding uh, new phenomena out there. Um, and I think the best is yet to come. So um, there will be these detectors will become much more sensitive over the next couple of years. Uh, currently, they are being upgraded. Um, so the detectors will become much more sensitive. Um, we'll actually get more detectors, um, and eventually there will be uh, third, what we call third uh, generation detectors that will essentially then be sensitive to the almost entire uh, universe uh, in terms of gravitational wave signals from from stellar mass objects like stellar mass black holes or, or neutron stars. Um, and so this is is really going to be very exciting. And as these detectors get more sensitive, we also hope to see. Uh, other new events that we haven't uh, seen so far, for example, um, supernova explosions uh, in gravitational waves, uh, which we haven't seen yet. We only see very indirect evidence from supernova explosions through visible light. But um, how these explosions actually work um, and what actually happens during those explosions um, uh, is something that um, hopefully and maybe gravitational waves will, will help us figure out. And perhaps there's there's even more surprises and um, and sources that you know we we don't even know of and we have no idea about. That's super exciting. So before when we get too in depth into your specific research, I think it's always interesting, especially to um, our undergraduate students who are watching, or to the young people or people who aren't maybe academics who are watching, to understand a little bit about you and about your journey um, coming to the prominence of where you are now. Uh, has it, it always been an interest in space and in astrophysics, or was it this sort of alchemical hunt for gold that uh, you've been on the, the you've been on the trail of for years and used <laughs> science to kind of find your way there? Right. Yeah. So, so uh, it, it it was not the latter, to be honest. It was the former. <laughs> um, so um, essentially, this cosmic alchemy uh, thing is only a fairly recent thing of mine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I, I developed that, that interest, um, uh, let's say, within the last six years or so, five to six years. Uh, but really, where it started is, um, is with essentially black holes and, and neutron stars and mm -hmm. astrophysics. Uh, like as a high school student, um, um, I'd say um, we had really great physics and, and math teachers. And so they got me really uh, into physics. Uh, I was interested in all sorts of things back then, but uh, but they really uh, sort of uh, you know directed my attention toward physics, I guess. Uh, and so I started like reading all these I think science that, books. I, I think that what that when we're we're in high school as well, you know, you you think you you have, a, you have an interest in space, or you have an interest in cosmic events and things of that nature, that understanding how the universe works, but. I think if left to our own devices, we don't necessarily realize that physics is the path to get there. So I think sometimes it takes some very active uh, high school teachers to sort of push you into saying, no, if you really want to know the answer to this, you need to go into physics yeah. because that's the way to find it out. Yeah, exactly. That's a great point. So um, this is exactly my, kind of my journey um, in a sense. So I, you know, I, I got really interested by reading all these popular science books on like black holes and relativity and, and stuff like that. Um, but then, and, and so then I knew, um, like through teachers and everything, obviously, you know, physics is the way to go, uh, to, to under, really understand that. And, and so I started, um, studying physics and I, to be honest, got a little bit bored uh, in the first, uh, one or two years learning about, you know, Newtonian mechanics and going all through all this. And I, I was like thinking like, okay, when, when are we actually going to do the, the exciting stuff that <laughs> I, I really want to learn about like astrophysics and, you know, relativity and stuff. Um, and, but, but, you know, I, I was kind of patient and, uh, I, I continued, uh, doing the studies. I got, um, uh, very interested in math as well and, um, um, and all these kind of things. And, and I think then what, what really got me into, into astrophysics is then like my, I guess my, my first contact with research, uh, in, in, in some sense, um, when, um, I studied at, 
at Imperial College um, for for a year uh, during my undergrad. It's kind of like a usual European thing where people, um, you know, go abroad for for one year during their undergrads to just, you know, have a change of sceneries, uh, study somewhere else, uh, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and and so there they had these like um, third year projects, um, and um, I was lucky to you know be able to do a project in, in astrophysics there, actually in solar physics, and so did some project on reconstructing um, uh, the solar irradiance. Um, so trying to understand how the how the sun shines in some sense, um, which is interesting and important for you know climate studies, but um, also for space weather and stuff like that. Anyways, that was fa fascinating and. Um, and that really hooked me up with astrophysics once and for all. Um, and so then coming back again to my um, to uh, where I actually studied, uh, which is in in Germany in in, in Freiburg, um, I then um, took classes in relativity, general relativity, and things like that, and then started sort of this path. Interesting. The um, so even as an undergraduate, you're clearly leaning more towards the theoretical aspect of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, you know, when we look at, at people who are doing astrophysics, there's, there's, I mean, as with all physics, you have, you know, your applied physics and you have your theorists. Um, and I think with, with, you know, astrophysics, the, the really, uh, the, the applied stuff is really uh, technical. I mean, you're building devices, you're creating instruments and you're sending them up to, to study. But in a lot of ways, I think, you know, even an experimentalist kind of becomes a theorist when you're looking at things up there and trying to understand how they work and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You you said you, you worked on, on the irradiance from the sun. What Where did you go from there? Has it always been an interest in stars and leading up to neutron stars? Or is that just kind of been the natural progression or growth? Yeah, so that was just uh, essentially by accident. So yeah. um, I... Uh, I wanted to do something in astrophysics, and you know um, that was what was available in terms of projects at, at, at the time. Um, but you know, I was pretty much interested in in all sorts of things, and um, um, so I dived in. Uh, I dived into this, and and that clearly um, sort of uh, arose my interest in stellar physics, um, um, and um, um, and you know, at some point, I kind of combined this with um, uh, general relativity, with relativity, and um, and studied. Started to study neutron stars um, and and black holes and uh, and how they collide. Um, so yeah, in, in some sense, the, it's it has been a, a random walk, but um, I, <laughs> I, I I kind of had I kind of had some interest that, that I was following all the time. But uh, you know how I how I got here is is um, there's there's a lot of um, uh, serendipity and, and 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 chance involved. Well, I, I want to get into the work with uh, neutron stars and collisions and black holes, but we had a question that came in uh, through our Instagram, which I thought, I, I wasn't sure if it was going to apply or not, but it, it kind of does apply. Um, we put up a question on our, our Instagram where you can follow Guelph Physics, uh, and it was in one of our polls in our stories. The question uh, is, was, what is the difference between radiation and irradiation? Right. So, um, the, so, so the one one of the processes of radiation is just uh, essentially uh, it just means essentially a bunch of photons uh, that are emitted from some source um, and um, are emitted into into space. Um, irradiation is is often used in the context of um, if if you know if there's an object that is being irradiated by some radiation. Mm -hmm. um, so, in in terms of the um, of the irradiation of the sun, um, I was just using that that term um, because we, we usually talk about uh, from the perspective of an observer, right? So, mm. so we're sitting, say, say we're on a satellite, uh, sort of close to the Earth, and we're watching the sun, uh, and we're uh, we're watching the radiation that the sun emits. Then we're uh, we're essentially irradiated by that uh, by that radiation, and that's what we measure. And so this is like just a technical term sometimes that, that people use to to describe yeah, no, that I, observer I, perspective. I it, it's an interesting, like, technical semantic argument that uh, I, I, I just found it interesting that it actually applied to our question. So uh, that question came in from Cultic522. So hopefully you're watching tonight and you had your question answered. Um, so let's get into this discussion about uh, great big giant things up in the sky banging into each other. So we've got neutron stars colliding. We've got neutron stars and black holes possibly colliding, possibly multiple black holes smashing into each other. Um, like you said, it was even until only, you know, five or six years ago that we had actual verifiable proof that 
black holes were even a thing through the gravitational waves. How do you go about modeling something like a collision between neutron stars? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, and it sort of connects a little bit to, um, to, to your earlier point on like theory versus uh, um, experiment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the it's fact that- we, can never, we, 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 you know, we can't study this. We can look at, at, at stuff that comes to us from it, signals from various devices, but, but how do you just go about and actually right. create that model? Yeah. Right. So and this is where computers come in um, and computational physics. Uh, which uh, I would argue is, is essentially also a field of physics by, just by itself um, and has become a field in physics by, by itself. Um, so essentially what we try to do is um, we try to take these systems um, and sort of feed them into a computer, into a large computer that is you know, as big as a huge hall. Um, and, and then we essentially use that machine, that computer um, as a lab in a sense. So it's, it kind of replaces uh, the the laboratory in, in in other fields of physics um and so we try to do numerical experiments um so we try to solve complicated equations um with that computer um under different conditions and so we kind of experiment um uh, essentially what would happen to the system and what kind of observables what kind of um emission um we would get from uh from certain collisions of black holes or neutron stars uh for instance so we really try to use uh, computers as um, as a lab, as a tool um, to to experiment, uh, to do that. What you know we cannot do in 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 in, in astronomy, uh, we cannot experiment, and so we we use the computer to do it. Um, so yeah, it, it, there's a lot of uh, math that goes into it, a lot of um, coding, um, a lot of uh, numerical um, schemes and um, numerical algorithms, design of algorithms that go into actually trying to describe these objects to model neutron stars and black holes on a computer uh, and see what the consequences are if you if you collide them. Well, it, it, it's a bit of an interesting sort of thing as well, because, you know, to what we were saying earlier, you're creating the, the, this theory, you're making this model, and kind of until recently, there was no real way to check and see if this model could be verified in any way. And I remember reading in one of the papers that uh, we were able to see this collision of neutron stars that just l literally happened to occur right at the same time as you were doing simulations of it. Yeah, yeah, um, that's exactly right. And so it's it's uh, to me it's really fascinating. Like when, when I entered the field, um, which was uh, essentially around 2012 or 13 as a grad student, um, it was really a niche. Uh, so we only had theoretical models on you know supercomputers about collisions of neutron stars and black holes there were no observations and um it was really a niche in astrophysics uh, there was hardly any conference or you know um um or you know panel discussions or so if you go to scientific conferences in in, in astrophysics there was there was essentially no discussion on this on this um uh, topic really um and to me it's fascinating how over just a couple of years it has completely transformed and uh, it has become uh, a really emerging field, a uh, very exciting field um, with the first observations that came in in 2016. So I have to say that neutron star mergers were, were only not, uh, detected, not only um, um, were not detected before 2017. Um, and so that took um, another year or two. Um, and finally, as of just uh, two weeks ago, I think, um, we witnessed the first uh, detection of a neutron star black hole merger. Um, so that uh, so now we know of all the three combinations, black hole, black hole, neutron star, neutron star, and neutron star black hole. So that's um, another very recent um, uh, development. And so it's, it's to me, it's really fascinating how this has completely transformed and, uh, and now it's become a very exciting field. There has been a Nobel Prize in, in, in the field for the detection of gravitational waves and things like that. So it has really taken off. Well, and I mean, you know, we, we have a pretty strong group here at Guelph that works on this exact type of thing. That's correct. So there's um, Eric Croissant, for example, there's uh, Juan Yang, uh, myself, uh, Liniala, uh, uh, Liliana Caballero as well on the nuclear astrophysics side. Um, so we really have a strong group here in Guelph who's uh, interested in precisely that, that area. 
it's 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 such a I don't know I, I find it to be such a neat and interesting thing. Now, so tell me, we we've got these giant cosmic events. You you have these neutron stars colliding. You have the black holes merging. Uh, what happens? What what do we find comes out from this type of large scale event? Right. And so that's exactly where my specific research comes in. Um, so I'm I'm really interested in what actually comes out of those collisions. Um, so say if you collide a neutron star with another neutron star um, or a neutron star with a black hole, uh, then it is kind of inevitable that as these stars collide, they actually eject material uh, into space. Um, so they essentially uh, rip material off the surface of, of each other. Of, of, uh, they rip off the material from the um, of their surfaces um, and um, eject that into space. Um, and that material is, is very peculiar um, because uh, neutron stars are very peculiar. Um, so there's um, there's a lot of neutrons, <laughs> yes, as you might oh, guess yeah. from the name, right? <laughs> so a fortuitous um, name. <laughs> right. So, so the, the really interesting thing here is that essentially uh, you uh, eject material that is um, to a large fraction composed of neutrons, um, you know, and then there's some protons in there as well. Um, but but that's that's a really peculiar thing. And as this material expands into space um, on a time scale of just a fraction of a second, uh, these neutrons start to recombine with protons to form um, to form nuclei to form um, atoms. And um, the interesting thing is that um, since you have so many neutrons in that system, so many more neutrons than protons, um, you actually trigger something that we call um, rapid neutron capture. Um, uh, so essentially, you, you form uh, individual nuclei that have uh, roughly equal numbers of neutrons and protons. So this is usually what ordinary material, everything that surrounds us is made of. Um, so all all the, the the atomic nuclei have you know roughly equal numbers of neutrons and protons, um, but um, so once you run out of you know these these uh, th these protons, then there's a lot of neutrons left over. Mm -hmm. So so what you do is you capture those neutrons onto these what we call seed particles or seed, seed nuclei um, in this process called neutron capture process, and that forms um, very heavy. Uh, nuclei much heavier than you know uh, these these little seed particles that you start with, and so it turns out you create a very very heavy elements, and that connects nicely to your fantastic introduction earlier. That um, this is actually how you populate you know the bottom rows of the periodic table. Um, so after iron, um, that's exactly your process. Um, that's what what populates the the periodic table, uh, forms um, um, these heavy elements. Um, all the way down to the to these bottom rows that we call the lanthanides and actinides um with like lots of elements that, that we know of like you know gold platinum uh, uranium um uh, maybe europium some of the these, these rare earth metals that uh, are used in electronics and, and things like that um so so it's really this this neutron capture process that um that, that populates uh, the bottom rows of the periodic table that comes in different flavors but i i, I should probably not go into into the the great details here, um, well, it, it's it's an interesting idea, and and you know, for somebody who's not necessarily involved in that type of research, it really was an interesting concept for me to even struggle with this idea that all of these elements come from somewhere and they're existing out in the ether, right? And then they just end up sort of swarmed into this planet on which we live, and we find them. Um, yeah. So I've, I've pulled up here, this is from a, a presentation of yours. This is a, the periodic table with a selection of different, the different processes and how they actually come about from being made. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we see that in the, 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 the hydrogen, the helium, a little bit in the lithium, you have the big bang fusion that takes place. Um, can you explain a little bit again, the difference between this, this S process and the rest of these types of fusion processes? Oh, sure, of course. So, so yeah, as you mentioned, so these light elements, uh, so like hydrogen, helium, and uh, and traces of, of of a certain lithium isotope are actually created in in the Big Bang. So when the universe was essentially just you know minutes uh, to seconds to minutes old, um, and uh, then sort of as you as you mentioned in your introduction, uh, sort of 
uh, these elements are then fused uh, in the bellies of stars, as you nicely put it, uh, to form um, uh, heavier elements, um, essentially up to iron, um, which is where the the nuclear binding energy um, reaches um, a maximum. Okay. And, okay. and so this is an interesting thing because I remember seeing that that nuclear binding plot when I was an undergrad and never right. understanding it. And uh, seeing the, the, the chunk up to fusion and then the split off to fission afterwards on that plot Correct. on that curve. And so this is the literal application of that, that curve. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so exactly at iron essentially you split between fusion and fission for for the higher uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the heavier nuclei uh, so it turns out iron is the most stable nucleus um, or say around iron you have the most stable nuclei it's actually nickel 56 which is um, uh, I believe the, st the most stable nucleus um, but in any case um, so this is where essentially the nuclear binding energy reaches its maximum and also if you wanted to go further then the Coulomb barrier of you know um, uh, of uh, of actually trying to, to capture charged particles on a charged nucleus becomes prohibit prohibitive in, in actually forming even heavier uh, heavy isotopes. So there's there's these two factors, one's, uh, one that the, the binding energy is, is, is maximized, but then also that uh, adding new charged particles, new protons to, um, to these uh, charged um, um, nuclei, like iron nuclei, also becomes prohibitive. So so then what you do is um, to get even to higher uh, mass numbers, um, you have to capture uh, neutral uh, particles, uh, neutrons, uh, that are not electrically charged, right? And so you can circumvent the, the Coulomb barrier and you can capture them onto, um, onto the C particles that you already have, like iron. Um, and so this is really the way to go um, beyond iron and to populate um, all the rest of the periodic table, as you can see, uh, there's many, many elements. It's actually the majority of the periodic table that's that's built in this form, um, and um, and so then there's these two variants of of this neutron capture process, um, or say mainly two variants. Uh, one that we call the S process, um, and one that we call the R process. So the S process means S for slow, uh, so slow neutron capture, meaning that you only gradually. Uh, um, you only gradually capture neutrons onto these C particles. Um, so what, what, what then happens is that the, the resulting uh, nucleus uh, can actually beta decay, uh, so what we call beta decay. So uh, the captured neutron or one of the neutrons can actually convert back into a proton by a beta decay. Um, and so as you capture more and more neutrons, um, then you can actually you know, uh, maintain roughly the balance between neutrons and protons um, as you as you go to toward higher um, to, toward higher mass numbers, um, and because it's really the balance between protons and neutrons that that defines stable isotopes. So you cannot have a, a random isotope with you know as many neutrons as you want. Um, you always have to you know roughly keep a balance, and so this is this process of slow neutron capture um, that gets you up until lead, um, and. And so then the other process is what we call rapid neutron capture. So this is essentially where you bombard a nu nucleus with uh, lots of neutrons. And so this, this nucleus doesn't have time to react to this bombardment. So it will have to just accept all these neutrons and, be, uh, and accept the fact that it's going to be an unstable nucleus um, um, for, for a while. Um, so it doesn't have the time to actually beta decay and convert the newly acquired neutrons back into protons so to maintain stability um, and so that's a very interesting process because it, it, it drives you into a very crazy regime of nuclear physics where um, you have highly unstable nuclei um, that you actually cannot form in the lab um, or you know most of them uh, you cannot form um, in the lab and you cannot measure um, and so it's really these collisions of neutron stars that that create these very exotic uh, uh, isotopes um, and uh, and that's exactly what happens in, in, in such a neutron star merger. Um, you create a lot of um, very unstable um, neutron rich isotopes that will then on some time scales decay back to, to stable isotopes. And the very interesting thing is we can actually observe that. <laughs> so yeah. we have actually observed this in um, what we call a kilonova um, a few years ago. So as I said, you form these very unstable isotopes and at some point you run out of neutrons because you know you, at some point you have captured all the neutrons onto the C particles, you form very heavy isotopes, very heavy nuclei. 
at some point you run out of these neutrons. And so then all these uh, nuclei are, are unstable and they have to decay uh, back to stable isotopes. Right. Um, and so they do that um, and release nuclear binding energy again. And that uh, nuclear binding energy heats up the material and makes it glow. So it sure. actually radiates photons. Um, and so we can actually directly see this formation of these, you know, very exotic, um, crazy isotopes um, by, uh, you know, uh, receiving those photons uh, from what we call um, a kilonova. And yeah. that was a breakthrough observation back in 2017, um, where we, for the first time, directly observed that um, such an R process, such a nuclear, uh, such a rapid neutron capture process is actually going on out there in the universe. Amazing. We have a question that's come in from uh, one of our, our YouTube viewers right now. So I feel it's probably a fairly apt time to show it. Uh, this question comes in from uh, J underscore C zero zero. Um, if the nuclei are formed during the R process, do they just float around in ionized clouds or are there other collision processes resulting in the production of electrons? So, um, I'm not exactly sure what um, uh, re regarding the electrons. Um, uh, so, so the background of, of, of the question, but so essentially, what what happens is um, this material is ejected at you know a fraction of the speed of light. So it's actually pretty. It's moving actually pretty fast. Mm -hmm. So say 10% the speed of light or so. Uh, sometimes 20, 30% the speed of light. Um, and so this material uh, runs into the ISM, into the interstellar medium, um, and that is not a vacuum. So there are actually hydrogen atoms and uh, and so on around. And so what it actually creates is a, a shock wave. Um, and in that shock wave, uh, you actually accelerate um, electrons and they can produce again, radiation, synchrotron, the so-called synchrotron radiation. Um, and this is actually something that we hope to see in the next couple of years that uh, from that shock that these heavy nuclei essentially create, um, that we would actually see that synchrotron radio emission as it shocks into the into the interstellar medium. Uh, that would be a pretty cool um, uh, observation to do. Totally. And I mean, I assume as, you know, our observational methods get better, these things are only going to improve and we're only, presumably we're only going to be seeing more verifications of the simulations that you're already running. Um, the James Webb Telescope is still set to be going up, and that should be adding to the information that we have coming in, uh, as long as well as many other plans for those types of large-scale telescopes going up. Yeah, that's right. So, so James Webb is uh, is is set to go, and uh, finally, um, also um, LSST, um, or now called um, 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 Grace the uh, Grace Telescope. Um, mm -hmm which is in the optical, um, those will be two fascinating um, uh, telescopes um, over the next couple of years uh, for precisely to, to look at uh, events like this, to look at these kilonovi, so for the signatures of our process production of these heavy element um, uh, production. Um, and it's a really perfect tandem because, uh, so LSST will be in the optical um, and so we'll capture uh, some of this, what we call blue emission. Um, and so James Webb will be in the infrared um, it's actually a, a super exciting mission because um, it, it's kind of like a Hubble Space Telescope, but uh, but in the infrared. Um, and so it, it turns out that you know there's not um, a lot of um, uh, we ha we haven't had a lot of like telescopes uh, observing in the uh, observing the sky in the infrared. So I'm I'm pretty sure there will be lots of exciting um, uh, new discoveries being made. Um, but anyways, that's a, a side remark. So we have perfect coverage over you know the the optical and the near infrared where we precisely uh, expect these, these kilonovi uh, to occur. And the really great thing about this is, is that um, they will be sensitive to such kilonova emission within the whole um, uh, detection volume, the sensitivity volume of the gravitational wave detector. So, um, so hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll have perfect coverage uh, for, for all the, the upcoming gravitational wave events. We, uh, if the viewer is interested, we had a live stream, um, I believe it was back in November or December with uh, some of the scientists at the, at IREX in Montreal, um, who discussed the James Webb and some of the uh, 
the new things that were going up that we could take a look at as well. So it'd be a nice little tandem if you're interested in this. Take a look back through our archives. Um, continuing on this idea of having questions, you know, we like to bring in an undergraduate's uh, sort of viewpoint here to go in and kind of explore this a little bit more and look at things that we haven't overlooked. But we still do want to get back to the search for gold. So we're going to make sure that we fundamentally can tell us where we can all get rich at before this is done. However, joining us is our uh, re roving reporter on the street. Uh, she uh, used to be one of our undergraduate viewpoints, but she's not so far removed from it now that she no longer has an undergraduate viewpoint. She has a newly graduated viewpoint. Uh, without any further ado, we'd like to bring into the stream Mel. And in classic Mel terms, she's muted. Fantastic. That couldn't have been more ironic. How ah. is that? <laughs> it never gets less embarrassing. A long time um, viewers will be happy with this classic Mel yeah. moment. <laughs> anyway, thanks for having me. No problem. Um, so I decided to do something a little different this time. And I thought to myself, astrophysicists are so cool, just in general, and then especially to people who don't really know anything about thanks. physics. So I was like, let me Google what is the most common question? Oh, Mel's got asked. a bit. Mel's so, got a bit here. I don't know how this is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was cool. So the question that came up is, what would happen if I fell into a black hole? That's, I mean, that's not a bad question. It's I'll not a that. bad question. That is a great question. question. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess there are different there are different outcomes of that scenario um, in, in some sense. So it, um, it depends. So, so the, I guess the, the answer is, the short answer is it depends. <laughs> um, if, if say you're, you fall into um, a stellar mass black hole, so say um, a black hole, you know, that's, that has a mass of say the sun or, um, or, you know, a few solar masses or so, then what typically will happen is that, um, Tidal forces, um, so gravitational forces, will just pull you apart as you fall into the black hole. And uh, and actually, prior to that, so um, so you will actually not notice it <laughs> if you're uh, falling into the black hole. Um, but then, if you, for example, take uh, a supermassive black hole, uh, let's say the the supermassive black hole in the center of our own galaxy, uh, Sagittarius A star. Um, so those those black holes um, are a little different in the sense that um, you can fall in there um, into the black hole and you won't really notice it. Um, so the, the gravitational pull, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive, I guess, but the, 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 the tidal forces will actually not pull you um, apart uh, prior to falling into the black hole. So you can find yourself inside the black hole without you know, noticing. Uh, the only thing you'll notice is, I guess, that you won't be able to communicate with the outside anymore. Uh, because there's something that you know we call an event horizon that prevents you know any information from you know leaking out or you know so um, so so that's the only thing you'll notice. I'm so glad I asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a way more interesting answer than I thought it would be. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess I will ask one more because I always like to like think about the undergraduate experience and kind of what mm -hmm. I experienced going into university. And mm -hmm. so what would you um, recommend students who are maybe in grade 12, maybe first year university, who are interested in this, listening at home and thinking, I wanna do this. What do you recommend that they do to kind of prepare themselves to get here and get to um, you know, high level physics understanding? Right, yeah, I mean, choose physics. <laughs> um, uh, enroll in some physics program, um, and um, as I said earlier, uh, in, in, in I experienced this in, 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 in my own um, uh, sort of career, if you want. Um, that um, yeah, be patient. Um, so you'll you learn you learn about mechanics and E and M and everything in the first couple of years, um, and it's only until like you know the third or fourth year or something that you, you'll be able to take uh, um, you know more in depth astro classes or uh, things more related to. To what we do in terms of black holes and neutron stars um, and, and things like that. So the exciting stuff will come. Um, it, it's out there. Um, be patient um, and yeah, read books. Um, get get involved um, um, and um, yeah, watch uh, 
YouTube uh, um, well, that's kind uh, of clips on black holes. Um, that, that, this is kind of, and this also becomes kind of the revolutionary thing about what's available now, is right. that you know we have things like this where you can find places and you can find departments that have active physics happening in what you want to do and seek them out and actually find the people who are working on it, which is, you know, something that we couldn't even do maybe 15, 20 years ago. So, yeah, yeah, that's right. So for example, I, I, I mean, I recall it from, from uh, sort of my, my own high school years. I mean, back then, I mean, YouTube existed, but it was not as popular as today. And there was not as much content, especially not as much physics content on there as, as, as there is today. So, you know, what I did was reading some popular science books on, you know, black holes and stuff. And, and that really got me excited. Um, and um, yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. I remember even when I was in high school, I found that there wasn't enough physics YouTube tutorials. And like going through my undergrad, you start to see more. And even just the tutorials that Orbex has done with the university, like there's there's definitely a lot more resources now. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, that's great. Mel, we're going to bring you back in a few minutes here to uh, do your, your famous closers as usual. But thank you very much. Um, I want to get into this while we still have a little bit of time left. There's about 15 minutes left. I, uh, I know that you've got some prepared video. We, we, we alluded to it earlier, this idea of neutron stars interacting or colliding and them tearing pieces out of each other. And I felt that maybe we should talk a little bit about these accretion disks that uh, are part of what you study. Yeah, um, that's a great question. So um, it turns out that actually, um, and that's again, a little counterintuitive, um, if you think in terms of neutrons being ejected into space and material being ejected into space. Um, I think what we uh, kind of learned only over the last uh, couple of years is that most of this material that, that is being ejected into space may not actually come from the collision itself, which would be sort of the, the, the simple um, uh, um, uh, thing that you, um, that you would imagine um, that, you know, this collision is really violent and that, uh, and that should, you know, shed a lot of mass in, in, into space. But it actually turns out that as these two stars collide, um, they form a remnant, uh, which uh, can be a neutron star or a black hole, or you know, it, it's, it's actually typically a very clumpy um, object, a very uh, um, peculiar neutron star um, that's unstable, gravitationally unstable. And uh, eventually, in most cases, it will collapse to a black hole. And so the interesting thing is that as these stars collide, um, lots of this material will actually start to circularize um, around this remnant object. And uh, that circularization process results in, in, in what we call an accretion disk. So it's essentially material that orbits around this black hole, say, and um, by uh, internal turbulence and, and mechanisms that you know, I won't go into detail here, it actually starts to, to force material to, you know, to fall into this black hole potential to actually accrete onto the black hole. So this material will not just uh, uh, you know, um, orbit this black hole forever, but it will actually gradually fall into the black hole. Um, and it's actually not so gradual. So these accretion rates, so the, 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 the rate at which a mass falls into the black hole is actually quite high. And it turns out that uh, as the material falls into the, in, uh, toward the black hole, it heats up. Uh, so some of this um, uh, uh, binding energy, this gravitational binding energy is converted mm. into heat. And, and, and that ejects, uh, that leads to what we call thermal wind. So it, it leads to mass ejection into space. So you can, you, can, you can think of this as like some accretion streams or some orbiting st stream around the black hole that essentially just evaporates itself. Yeah. Um, and it's really I... this evaporation process uh, that um, actually releases a lot of material in, into space. And uh, we now think that in most scenarios, this evaporation process is really where most of the, the up process elements come from in, in such collisions. Interesting. And, and, and how much of this is just entirely theory? And what of this has been, have we been able to see now that we're seeing so much more information come in? Yeah, that, 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 that's a great question. So, um, it was it was both uh, essentially theory and observations that now uh, make us uh, think that this is actually the case. Um, so interestingly, I, I was working on, on on some of these accretion disk models for uh, for this you know post merger phase, um, and so we we were actually putting out a paper on this 
which was a purely theory paper. So it was a prediction based on you know our supercomputer simulations. Um, and then it just ha so happened um, uh, by pure chance that uh, the gravitational wave detectors would observe this first neutron star merger in 2017. Um, only a, right few right months, That's a <laughs> or only a few months after uh, after we essentially put out this paper. And so the kilonova that I already talked about that we observed after that was observed after this um, this gravitational wave detection event um, was actually showing a signature that is very uh, very much consistent and indicative of of this accretion disk uh, scenario where essentially most of the ejecta that we saw with this kilonova must have come from such an accretion disk. Hmm. Um, so there, there's a sort of strong evidence that um, that it was really, in fact, this, ev this evaporation process I talked about that created this kilonova or you know, a substantial fraction of this, of this kilonova and of the, of the elements that were observed for the first time in this 2017 event. It's super exciting. And I guess my, a question that I would have from that is, how common are these types of events? Do we expect to see this occurring all the time and we've just not been able to detect it so far? Yeah, yeah. Um, so so they are, these events are you know, uh, quite frequent. Um, it's only limited by, by our ability right now to actually detect them frequently. Um, so our detectors are only sensitive to a certain you know, uh, volume in the local universe, so yeah. say um, yeah. you know some volume around our solar system, and so if you then do the basic calculation of how many events you expect there to be in a given volume at a given time, the rate is actually fairly small. Um, but as the detectors, as I said, become now much more sensitive, so they're being upgraded right now. Uh, we will so we actually expect uh, in this next observation run, which will start sometime next year, uh, probably in the late fall. Um, maybe even later, who knows, right now, um, because of COVID, uh, things are uncertain. But um, but uh, for, for this next observation run, um, we actually expect something like tens of mergers of such neutron star, neutron star mergers per year. So the observation run is planned for something like a year or so. So we expect to be there something like 10, maybe 20, maybe 30. Um, if, if we're lucky, of these neutron star neutron star mergers uh, being detected with with these um, with these um, uh, gravitational wave detectors, um, the rates um, um, might also be uh, might be even higher for 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 other sources like binary black holes uh, and things like that. But but that's that's a typical number uh, that that we'll expect. Um Exciting. Well, do you do you have? I, I know we have a video out here of these accretion disks. Should we take a take a watch at that? Uh, it's action. Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Can bring it up. Yeah. Um, so here we see essentially a, here. A, a supercomputer simulation um, uh, from from our group uh, performed by Luciano Combi, who is uh, who is one of the the graduate students. Um, and so yeah, thanks by the way, Luciano, for for that nice movie. <laughs> um, he might be watching uh, now. I don't know. Um, so well, here we see essentially two neutron stars as they as they collide. Um, so this is a basic uh, supercomputer simulation uh, that, that we do. Something like this runs for, um, you know, sometimes uh, something like two months or so on a, on a big supercomputer. So you have to be really patient in doing these, these simulations. Um, and it simulates only a tiny fraction, like, like only tiny uh, duration in physical time. So you can see like the time running in the, in the, in the lower yeah. right corner, which is milliseconds. Um, yeah. So here we just simulated the system for essentially 20, 30 milliseconds. And that is a typical time scale of such collisions. Really? So wow. it is really crazy if you think about two neutron stars, each the size yeah. um, or the mass of the sun. And they orbit, orbit each other, um, you know, in this final and spiral phase in kilohertz with kilohertz frequencies. Um, so this is um, this is well, absolutely no you fascinating. You get gravitational waves coming off these things. They're mad. exactly <laughs> they're spinning so quickly. And then exactly. It, and so those um, the 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 spiral elements that we see visually, that's the ejecta that you were talking yeah. about before. Exactly. The, the the right. So this is what we call this dynamical ejecta. So this is material that's been ripped off the surface of the stars um, during Actually, this. Bring that back up again so we can see the uh, yeah during this the, during this collision process. Um, and so you clearly see the signature of tidal forces by, with these spiral arms. Um, and that is material that's ejected um, at 
at this early stage of the of the merger process. Um, and, and so, by the way, we, we see like this orbital plane, so um, of, of the binary in, in the in the lower panel, and then essentially the upper panel is just like rotating this by ninety degrees. So in, in, instead of phase on, you you, you see it like uh, um, edge on. Um, yeah. yeah. And so you see the neutron stars like moving in and out of the plane. So this is like this this weird signet, signature you see there. Um, yeah. And and so as, as these neutron stars collide, you, you see that also like from this interface uh, where they where these two neutron stars touch, where they first touch, um, there's also lots of ejecta that's being just squeezed out from that interface. Um, and that's super fast material. Um, it's, it's actually hard to see this here in, in, the, in the movie, but you know if you do a more careful analysis of this, you, you'll see that th there's material, so neutrons being uh, accelerated up to um, 80, 90% the speed of light. Um, so wow. crazy fast neutrons that are being produced at this interface, uh, which have additional interesting signatures. Um, so there's new free neutron decay, so you can actually see individual potentially, this is hopefully something we'll see in the next couple of years, uh, the decay of free neutrons, uh, which will also result in some um, ultraviolet uh, radiation that we hope to see with telescopes. Um, anyways, so there's this really fast material that's being ejected from the interface. And then also the movie nicely showed how these two neutron stars then essentially merge to form this very clumpy object that we call a hypermassive or supramassive neutron star. Um, it's just a very strange object um, um, uh, that is gravitationally unstable. And the, the movie ends uh, just shortly before this object collapses to a black hole. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. we, we don't have that on the movie, but um, uh, um, but uh, believe me, a few milliseconds after it, it collapses into a black hole. And but what you can already see is that uh, some of that material starts to circularize around this remnant and forms this accretion disk I was talking about. Um, so this material orbiting the orbiting the remnant, and it has actually some some lateral structure uh, which you can see in the in the in the top uh, layer. Um, so it's 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 actually um, a fairly thick, um, um, geometrically thick accretion disk uh, stream around that black hole. And the evaporation of that material uh, over much longer timescales um, uh, beyond what we simulated here uh, is essentially what ejects um, most of the material um, into space. And is any percentage of it drawn back in once the black hole is formed? Or is it ejected so quickly and at such a high speed that it's escaping this before there's even an issue of a gravitational drawback in? Yeah, so there's uh, there's um, um, a good fraction of material being accreted into the black hole. So um, so typically something like sixty percent or so. Oh, really? Um, okay. Of the of the so there's so that still is the dominant um, process. You're absolutely right. Um, so typically the dominant um, fraction of, of of the disk material is uh, falls actually into the black hole. Hmm. Uh, but the surprising thing is that forty percent does not. <laughs> Uh, and so that 40% overcomes the gravitational pull of that black hole uh, and will actually leave that system, will actually um, um, go out into space, will be energetic enough uh, to be able to, to, uh, to overcome that gravitational pull and, and, um, and, and travel uh, into the ISM. Huh. Well, it's pretty exciting. Well, I'd like to bring Mel in here. We're 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 getting close to uh, to wrapping up, but th there's been a couple questions that have kind of uh, been coming through the streams, and ones that I've seen um, also come through the Instagram as well. And uh, perhaps it's a good one to to do while Mel's here, which is when we're we're learning about so much of this new stuff, uh, gravity, uh, uh, relativity. A lot of that has been not incredibly accessible to people who don't focus in on it. Um, are we looking at seeing effectively new physics or better theories of gravity coming out of all of this type of research? Yeah, that's a great question. So testing gravity, so testing general relativity or um, yeah. investigating gravity theories in general is, is one of the hot topics as well in this field. Um, so, for example, uh, one of the you know very basic question is whether Einstein's theory of gravity is actually um, you know what, what you know what nature does, <laughs> um, and so there's all you know all sorts of alternative theories of gravity um, that you know people have proposed, um, uh, and so, some some of which can be constrained uh, ex sort of 
to some degree experimentally. Um, and so this type of source, meaning the collision of two black holes or of neutron stars and black holes, is also one of the prime systems now to actually test gravity um, yeah. or to look for alternative theories of gravity. Um, so far, we haven't you know, obtained any evidence that uh, Einstein's theory of uh, relativity would be um, um, sort of would be uh, wouldn't be the correct description um, for these mergers, um, but um, but it's being tested, and as the detector sensitivity, as I mentioned, um, uh, will uh, will increase over the next couple of years. Also, the precision with which um, Einstein's theory is being uh, tested will uh, will heavily increase as well, um, and so this is mostly done by looking at the gravitational wave signal itself. So this has nothing to do essentially with the neutrons and, and the R process and gold and, and stuff like that. So um, it's really about the gravitational wave signal um, and looking for deviations of what we would expect um, relative to predictions for Einstein's uh, theory of relativity. And that's a very active uh, field of research um, indeed. Yeah, it, it seems, it, it, as, as with everything with physics, it seems that the more we learn about, the more questions it just raises in yeah. terms of going back and re-examining everything. Um, right. It's exciting. I mean, I, I personally never thought I would be alive in a period where we were detecting gravitational waves. And the fact that we are is fundamentally phenomenal and exciting as proof that so much of what we were working with before is, is true. Um, and it, and it's real, so it's great. Yeah. Mel, what do you got for me? Should we take? Are we are we wrapping up? Is this is this the intro guess, to my final question? I guess we are. It's eight o'clock. It's been an hour. <laughs> people have been. Uh, I I think people's minds have been uh, fundamentally blown. I think we can say that <laughs> at this point. Uh, we <laughs> we we've gone right through from math to esoterics to back again. Uh, so, so Mel, we might as well go uh, with our, you can, I'll uh, give us our closing question and then I'll take us out after that. Okay, awesome. Um, so we love to ask this and get like all the different variations of answers. What okay. in your professional career in research as an astrophysicist has been the most exciting day for you? The one most exciting day? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a great question. Um, <laughs> I have to think. Um, so I, I would say perhaps, uh, perhaps indeed the moment where we saw the first neutron star merger and mm -hmm. we saw that kilonova and it kind of became apparent that, you know, some of the things that we've been working on before uh, were actually providing a consistent picture or interpretation, say, for, for the event. Um, and that is something that was probably not happening exactly at you know one specific day. I would actually have, I'm, I would have trouble to actually nail it down to one single day. <laughs> but I think it was a, a very exciting development over um, at least you know weeks to months um, when when all of this became apparent. Um, and I think that was really a fantastic um, a fantastic moment, a fantastic discovery, something that you cannot plan, <laughs> yeah. uh, something that that just happens. Uh, and kind of highlights how serendipity and chance is, you know, plays a big role in, in a career, in, you know, in science in general. Um, and um, I, yeah, I would say this was certainly the most, uh, the most fascinating moment. Yeah, I can only imagine the excitement from you and your team. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us tonight, Mel. We appreciate that uh, for coming back out of retirement for uh, this live stream. <laughs> Hopefully you'll continue to come back out of retirement for us. Um, but we'll, uh, well, is there, if, if we have uh, viewers who want to keep up with what you're doing, how do they follow you? Uh, so, so um, they can Google me on the um, faculty web pages at Permit Institute or at the University of Guelph, and there's a link also to our group website. Um, we actually have, um, you know, a little bit of description on, on the group website um, about what we do, um, uh, with a little bit of material also on, in, in terms of like, you know, popular science articles on some of the work we do. Um, um, we'll also try to populate this in the future a little more with um, like YouTube clips and, and things like that. Um, so there should be a little bit of material out there if if, if people are interested in. Fantastic. And Mel, how do people follow you? 
Great question. Um, so I've got a LinkedIn. <laughs> I've got Facebook. <laughs> I've got Instagram. Um, if you Google my name, I think I'm the only Melanie Hudacock that shows up. So if you Google me, um, I'm pretty easy to find. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for joining us tonight, Mel. Uh, Dr. Siegel, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We'll say goodbye to you off the air, so hang tight. But uh, uh, the research is fascinating. It, uh, space has always been such a galvanizing idea for science and for people. I don't think anybody hasn't looked up at some point and thought, what's going on up there? And I mean, it inflames the passion in all of us to understand the universe around us. So it's such exciting work. Thank you for taking time for us tonight. We really do appreciate it. Uh, and best of luck in your continued research. Of course. Thank you so much, uh, Orbex. That was fantastic. A great pleasure to be here on the stream. Thanks for having me. No problem. Cheers. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. If you are following Guelph Physics, please make sure to follow uh, YouTube for further streams. We'll be joining us again in August. And then we'll continue uh, probably with uh, much more regularity in the fall. So uh, follow Guelph Physics on YouTube, follow Guelph Physics on Facebook, and follow Guelph Physics on Instagram. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, we're interested in hearing any of your thoughts. And if there's any uh, future topics that you'd like us to dig a little bit deeper into, then just send us a message and let us know. But until then, take care, everyone, and have a science-tastic day.